What's up, Algebra 1? Today we are talking about graphs. We are going to add a few vocab words for tomorrow's lesson for the most part. Just kind of review the things we've been talking about for the first few days. We've been talking about independent versus dependent. We've been talking about characteristics between graphs. Uh, we've also talked about solving equations along with evaluating expressions. So let's jump into it. It says record the letter of each graph with the given characteristic. And so it says uh, the first one has a vertical axis of symmetry versus having a horizontal axis of symmetry. So I thought, you know, maybe we didn't really cover that very much. So why don't I just Google vertical and horizontal axis of symmetry and let's talk about it for a minute. If you're familiar with the word symmetry, uh, the letter A has symmetry because you can cut it in half. The letter O has symmetry because you can cut it in half. The letter U, the letter V, both of these have symmetry because you can cut them in half. But not all letters are symmetrical. For example, the letter R. If you cut R in half, it's not the same as it is on the left and the right. So not every single graph or every single item is going to have symmetry. But some do and some don't. So for this one, we're talking about a vertical line that would cut a graph in half, kind of like this one. Uh, or maybe it's more of a horizontal line that cuts the graph in half. So that's kind of what we mean by this idea of a horizontal or vertical axis of symmetry. So if I'm kind of looking at uh, these different graphs, uh, I'm looking at B. B seems to be uh, one that could have some vertical symmetry. Um, now, C, I think it also has some symmetry. Uh, I know it kind of looks like there's more points on the right than the left, and that's true, but we have to remember that these arrows go up forever in both directions. So it will continue up, and they're, they're going to be symmetrical no matter what. So record the letter of each graph with the given characteristic. I'm definitely feeling like graph B and graph C really have some type of vertical symmetry. Now horizontal symmetry, I'm not really sure. I mean, when I cut these in half, there's no real way to get the exact same thing on each side. So I'm not really seeing any horizontal symmetry here. Okay. Uh, passes through exactly one quadrant. If we're talking about quadrants, and maybe you've had that uh, knowledge from previous courses, or maybe this is the first time you've thought about the idea of quadrants, in the middle of the word quadrant is the word quad, and quad can mean four, like quadrilateral. So the, the way we label quadrants is using Roman numerals or the numbers one, two, three, and four. So we always start with when numbers are positive. So if I was to go right and up, this first quadrant would be quadrant one. And then we're gonna move counterclockwise and naming the rest of them. So we have quadrant two, quadrant three, and quadrant four. And remember that these are all Roman numerals. One, two, three, and four, okay? So it says it passes through exactly one quadrant. I like A. A seems to only exist in this top quadrant. And yes, it does have a point that's on that axis, which isn't really in a quadrant. But I would say it passes through one quadrant for the most part. So I'm thinking about adding graph A there. Um, but B and C, they both seem to go into multiple quadrants. This one goes into all four quadrants, so I'm not really sure I want to mark that one for 1C. However, it is asking us about, um, you know, are there any graphs that pass through all quadrants? And I'm, I'm thinking B. B seems to pass through all the quadrants here, and so uh, I think those are going to be my answers for those. Let's move on. Uh, I have a few more that I want you to do. So I want you to look at each of these. And I only talked about A, B, and C, so if you could just throw D, E, and F also up into either A, B, C, or D, depending on what you believe it has. Does it have a vertical axis symmetry? Do you think it has a horizontal axis? Does it pass through exactly one quadrant, or is it really going through all four quadrants? So just think about that with these other three, okay? 
Uh, we're going to the next page, and we're going to review uh, one, two, and three. And so this is really a review of what we did the day before. Uh, we talked about independent versus dependent variables or quantities. So let's jump into it. Read each scenario and identify the independent and dependent quantities. So that's the first thing I really need to make sure I do. Next, it says be sure to include the appropriate units of measure, then determine which graph models the scenario. So it seems like I have three things to do. Independent and dependent labeling, figure out what unit of measure is needed, and then lastly, is it graph A or is it graph B that completes this first scenario? So it says, Henry is cooking a turkey for his family. His recipe says to cook the turkey for 15 minutes per pound. So the idea is that if you were to make a table in your mind of uh, what this is kind of uh, going through in terms of the story and cooking and, and the turkey and all that, I kind of want my X idea to be the independent variable, and I want the Y to be the dependent variable. So in this scenario, what determines what? Is it the weight of the turkey that determines the time, or does the time really determine the weight? Okay, so... I'm thinking that, honestly, it's the weight that you get to decide. You get to pick out the turkey. Is it a one-pound turkey? Is it a two-pound turkey? Is it a three-pound turkey? You get to choose how big the turkey is. However, you don't get to choose how long you have to cook it for it to be cooked correctly because there's a rule here, 15 minutes for every one pound. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to make X the pounds, like how heavy the turkey is, and I'm going to make Y the time. So now I can kind of think through, well, if it was a one pound turkey, it would, it would take 15 minutes. Or, well, what if it was a two pound turkey? Well, that would take another 15 minutes, 30 minutes total. Or what if it was a three pound turkey? Well, three times 15, we're talking about 45 minutes. And then you can just keep going on and on and on as long as you want. But for the most part, we've kind of identified, walking through the story, what's the independent and what's the dependent. And so when I'm thinking about uh, labeling this, I'm probably going to either label uh, up here in the problem, or you can just kind of say out to the side. So I'd say uh, the independent, the independent variable is the uh, weight of the turkey. And the dependent variable is the time, cooking time. How long do you have to cook it? Okay. Now, in terms of units, all the weight seems to be in pounds. And if I keep reading in the problem, it says that he wants to cook for 15 minutes. So there's just an extension of the units of measure that's also asked in the problem. Now, I kind of got to figure out, is that more graph A or is that more graph B? Well, it seems like the x-axis, as it gets larger, 1, 2, 3, the time that it takes also gets larger, 15, 30, 45. So I don't like graph A because that seems like the heavier the turkey, the less time you need to cook it. And that's what I do like about B. Okay, if it's a zero pound turkey, well, you don't cook it. Zero pounds, zero minutes. However, one minute later, or sorry, one pound later, you're going to be up here at 15 minutes. Or at two pounds, you're going to be up here at 30 minutes. Maybe that last one, that three pounds, that goes up here and hits that 45 minutes. And that just continues on and on and on. So that's why I really like graph B to model that scenario. So I want you to kind of think about that same concept. We'll talk about this one tomorrow in class. When Jane exercises on an elliptical machine, that's kind of like a treadmill and a bike put together, her initial heart rate, initial means at the very beginning of her exercise, uh, that heart rate is 90 beats per minute. She warms up at this rate for five minutes. Over the next five minutes, she gradually increases that heart rate to 150 beats per minute. She's gonna maintain that rate. It's gonna be constant for about 15 minutes before it gradually goes back down to her original heart rate. And that original heart rate, going back to the beginning of the problem here, 
that should be at the very end for the 30 minute workout. So tomorrow we'll talk about graph A, graph B, graph C. Which of those would you circle that really makes that true in that problem? Once you do that, go ahead and label the axis. Like what would you call the independent? What would you call the dependent? If I was going to write some labels on the side, whatever graph you pick, whether you pick A or C, try to label what you think uh, you know about the problem, values, units, whatever. And uh, we'll check that tomorrow. Now lastly, we're going to talk for just a few minutes about solving and evaluating. So solve. I'm going to solve 8y plus 13 equals 29. And then here in a moment, we'll evaluate this other expression. So the second problem, solve the equation. Solving means you're finding the value of the variable that makes the equation come out to be true. So for example, 8 is multiplying by some value of y, and when I add 13 to it, I'm getting 29. So the first thing I'm thinking is well, what plus 13 is 29? Go ahead and try to figure out what does 8y have to equal. So I'm going to do the opposite of adding, and I'm going to subtract. And these are like terms, so 8y equals uh, 16 now. And remember, in algebra, when you see a number and a variable up against each other, that really represents multiplication. So this question is really asking, well, 8 multiplied against what number would be 16? And so we'll do the opposite of multiplying. We'll divide that 8 to the other side, and we figure out that that number is 2. Sorry. So that number is 2. That kind of solves our equation for us. And if you plug that back in, you'll see how that works. That gives you the correct value of 29. 8 times 2 is 16, and 16 plus 13 does in fact give you 2. So this is correct. Alright, last problem here. We're going to evaluate this expression. 6z plus 5 parenthesis negative 2z minus 7. Okay? And it also tells us what the value of z is. It says that z is the number negative 1. So I kind of want to take a moment just to replace z with the number negative 1 so that we can really explore what this value comes out to be. Okay? Now, because I want to use grouping, like parentheses, to show where variables go, uh, that's okay for the first one. For example, I can just replace z with negative 1. When you have parentheses already, you know, if I, if I add another parenthesis and I have a parenthesis in a parenthesis, that can get kind of uh, hard to look at. So upper level mathematicians, they use a bracket so that it's easier to look at and you can kind of tell what was going on. So I'm plugging in the number negative 1 in for z as well in that parenthesis. So let's start with our parenthesis. And so negative 2 multiply negative 1. If I put these together, I'm getting 2. And now I can go ahead and subtract the 7 so that I can know that really this is 5 multiplied against negative 5. Well, might as well go ahead and think, well, what is 6 multiplied negative 1? That's negative 6. And then we can just keep on going 5 and negative 5 multiplied to be negative 25. And then our final answer here, if you owe me $6 and you want to borrow 25 more, not a problem but you do owe me 31, so that is a negative 31. Okay. Hope this has been helpful, and I will see you tomorrow.